Hi friends, this is Marie Spalding of Living Felt. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are super excited to bring you our video series on needle felting, your very own pet portrait. Needle felting a realistic pet is so much easier than you might think, and I'm gonna show you how to do it step by step. This is a multi-part video series, so first things first, make sure you subscribe, there should be a link right down there, subscribe to our channel so that you get all of the videos, and notice down below that there is a link to getting a reference document for this set of videos. If you don't see the link, go to our website and click on learn so you can see how to get quick access to all the videos and PDF support materials for this. We'll provide a complete supplies list and you can download that in a PDF format. As well, all of the videos will be on our website under learn, under video tutorials, and you can make sure to click all of them there. In this video, this is our getting started and set up. So what we're gonna do is I'll go over some tips and insights to help you get started. We'll go over the supplies that we used. I'll show you those as well. We'll show you how to do the image transfer. That'll be a quickie version. There's also a complete video on doing an image transfer for people who don't freehand or draw like myself. And then we'll look at the wool being used. That's what we're gonna do in this video and we'll try and set markers down below so you can jump to a particular section if that's what you want to do. Needle felting a pet portrait is so much easier than you might think and I feel one of the reasons I really wanted to do this video was because for years, even as old as I am, I would still say I can't do realism or I don't do realism well and I found over the years that I never really tried and never really applied myself and now just over two months ago is the first time I really gave it a go. Um, so I'll show you the pictures that we've done so far, but this is like my fifth or sixth. It's only my fifth dog portrait. And um, this is just a step-by-step -step process and I feel like if I can do it, anyone can. So what I wanna say as far as starting with tips and tricks, and the first thing is, you know, have some patience with yourself in this process. If you've never done this before, if you're like me and you have no artistic training or haven't even taken an art class since high school, it doesn't mean that this is out of reach for you to do something realistic, because I'm that person. The first time I tried to do something realistic was just over a year ago, and I realized I was really shy about it. I tried another animal that was based on a professional photograph that was sleeping. I felt a little, with the eyes closed, I felt encouraged. Um, I did, let's see if I have it. This is the first dog portrait that I ever did, and this was just two, two months ago. Um, we'll show that on the side also. And then this was the second, right here. This is the second one I ever did. So this um, series you're looking at right here, this is the third, which was, is a friend's dog, so I'll be sending this one off soon. This is the fourth one, so I'm starting to fill in the backgrounds and liking that effect. And then this little guy for the class, this is the fifth one. And because I'm having so much fun and I'm feeling so inspired, what I really wanted to do was teach the class and say, look, it doesn't matter if you've never done this before. It doesn't matter if you think you can't. Just give it a try and follow this little step by step. So that's the first thing. Have some patience and apply yourself. The second tip, work from a really good quality photograph. Work from one that's clear, that's not blurry, that's a good image of your animal. And if you really wanna go for it and really go for that realism, try and get one with an eye that has some really nice reflection and a lot of clarity. We're gonna start with the eyes and that's gonna make your animal look really alive. So we're gonna show you exactly how to do that. When you have a reference image, it should either be a photo quality printout that you have done at the drugstore um, or the 
print shop or on your own photo paper, but it should be a nice photo quality printout and um, or something on your tablet or computer that you can blow up to be really big. So have a great reference photo and use it often. If you want to emulate an image that you really see, then always refer back to that image. You're going to start to train yourself, if you're not already, to focus in on tiny, tiny areas of detail. I don't, you know, segment the image and grid it out like some people do. With this process, we're going to do a direct image transfer and we're going to, you're going to get to choose those areas you focus on. But keep your reference image really close and use it often so that you're always referring back to it. Um, you will need to print out an image. This is some, we have some students coming in this week that are going to do an in-person class. So you will need to print out your image and we'll show you how to do that image transfer. It can be in color or black and white, but you will need a printout in reverse. So you'll want to be able to reverse your image either in a software program or using your printer doing reverse image transfer. Consider some practice pieces. So maybe for your first pet or animal that you do, maybe it isn't your beloved pet or one of a dear friend. Maybe it's one that you just want to allow to come through you and let it be however it is so that you just sort of build your skills. So I think that would help relieve a little pressure. And the other thing is to consider an eye study. You'll see in the reference materials that we give you a sheet you can print out that's just a series of dog eyes. Just as one example, you can make your own of any kind of animal, human, or other eyes. But consider just doing an eye study where you take off the pressure of doing a complete image and you just apply yourself to learn to focus and build your skill on doing those individual sets of eyes. It's really a lot of fun. I've done the same thing myself. So just really encourage yourself to be a student and maybe take some pressure off yourself by letting the animal just be one that inspires you or doing the eye study or something like that so that you learn how to work with the materials and that you've chosen to work with and then maybe even choose some different ones to better support the way you like to work. Um, I want to say make sure that you can see and you have good light. And so that is to say this isn't a great project for doing in a dark living room while you're watching TV with someone else or you're watching a movie that's really important to you. You really want to be able to see what you're doing. The first image I ever tried to do in realism was about this size, about this big, and I found that I was working at an angle, and then when I turned the image this way facing me, it didn't look the same. It looked correct this way and not correct this way. So whatever the parameters you're working with, make sure you have good light, make sure that you can see your subject or your reference image well, and that you can really see what you're doing on your piece well, whether you use readers or magnifier or some other kind of uh, means, just make sure you can really see what you're doing. And then I want to encourage that you experiment with your materials. I'm going to show you what I use um, and just be willing to experiment and save back some of your experiments. So those are probably my top tips. This tutorial is not intended for you to do the same dog that I did. It's to show you how to do the process. So the uh, reference image for this dog is not one that I can distribute. Um, we may have some other, this is a, a boxer that we did, um, and we may have some other boxer images that we can share with you. And we'll look for, that, look for that in the resources as well. But this is really designed to teach you the processes you can do the animal of your choice and give it a go rather than emulate this exact project. That's how it's designed. Okay, so now we're going to look at the supplies that we've used. The first thing I'll go over is the wool. We're using Livingfeld brand MC1 batting. These are examples of two ounce increments. It also comes in studio packs. Uh, yes, this is the batting that we make. I make this fiber because this is what I like to work with for a very broad spectrum of the things I felt. Not everything, um, but for needle felting and wet felting pictures and lots of other items, it's really fabulous. If you're a wet felter right now, this isn't what you would put next to the skin for a scarf or something, but it makes great hats and shoes and purses and pictures and sculptures and such. 
The reason we like it for these types of projects, um, one, it needle felts to a really smooth finish. You can really flatten it out. And two, you can pull off little teeny tiny pinches and we make it in about 75 colors. So in this project, we're gonna be working with Living Felt MC1 batting and I'm gonna show you how to blend that. I wanna offer this one encouragement when it comes to the supplies. Whatever fiber you're using, save back a portion of the label and a little pinch sample so that you know where you got it, what was the name of the color, and what type of fiber it is. Our fibers always come labeled with the breed and the processing and the color. Um, so save back a pinch sample for yourself as you're building your fiber library or reference book. And then for your project, consider saving back just even a little baggie of the colors you use and list what. Um, project that was for like this is just a pinch sample of every color I use in my foxes uh, which I didn't bring in today but this way if I ever need to look back it's not organized but it was my final grab as I was wrapping up the project so consider saving back little pinch samples and if you make your own blends which we're going to show you how to do you'll want to save all the colors that led up to the blends and references of the blend so we're going to show you that separately the other tools you'll need primarily is a work surface. We're using Living Felt um, Earth Harmony Foam. We sell this in all kinds of sizes from 5 inches by 5 inches on, on up. This is a 10 by 15. This is our, um, not our biggest, we have one bigger than this, but this is at this time. This is our 16 by 20 picture foam and this is what I've been doing my most recent ones on. Whenever you're felting, you're going to want to make sure and peel your picture off the background quite frequently because you don't want the fiber to become embedded in the foam. So if you're brand new, it's, there's a tendency not to remove it, but make, you'll just want to peel off your picture as you work. So you're going to need a work surface and we use this foam. You'll also need some felting needles. The ones I use the most in this is a 42 gauge triangle. Ours are marked yellow. Um, you might also use a green 42 triangle and then a pen tool for filling in the backgrounds, especially our large surface areas. Not very complicated. Um, you don't need some really fancy items to do this project. For the backgrounds, you will need some kind of background. This is 100% wool felt. It's one millimeter thick. Um, you might like something a little bit thicker, so these come in small sheets. Some of these pictures you'll see I did on our MC1 batting, like this one. It's done on our MC1 batting that was first felted to this shape. I'm finding that when you get really detailed in the eyes, the wool really wants to compress down. And as the substrate or background compresses, you start to lose surface area. So I'm finding that I like something that's very, um, very well felted to work on. This guy, these last two ones are an example. So this was done on the wool felt that you see. And then I filled in all of the background. Same with this little guy. He's done on 100% wool felt that was cut to a smaller size. And then these are nice and thin so they would mat and frame really well. So consider experimenting with different things. This little guy was done on linen. And I like it and I don't like it, but if you want your image floating out in the universe, you could do it on linen or you might do it on colored felt. So you might choose a, you might choose a color and just let your image float around. So play with different backgrounds and see how that works for you. I didn't bring in the transfer pen. There's a separate video for that for doing the image transfer. So that's something you might or might not need. Depends on whether you freehand. Um, and then the last thing might be a set of hand cards. A set of hand cards, you're gonna see how we blend the fibers. We have a separate video for blending the fibers. So you can see how we build up a bulk of color. Now our fibers come in over 75 colors, but sometimes you might need this just a little bit darker or a pinch lighter or a bit more to a muted brown. So we have a video for how to hand card the fibers and get different gradations and these are very easy to use and it's a great thing to experiment with. So those are the basic supplies that you'll need for these projects. Okay so now we're going to jump to the image transfer and as I mentioned we have a more detailed 
video for this if you're doing it for the first time, but just real quick, we're going to run through how to do the image transfer if you're not going to freehand your image onto your background. In this segment, we're just going to take a look at the colors we're going to use for this dog portrait. And we are using Living Felt MC1 batting. So it's made by Living Felt. It is a merino cross bat. Um, it comes in two ounce increments and there are also color assorted packs. And if you've only been working with roving, I just want to show to you how it comes. This is an example of a two ounce roll. You've probably seen me work with it in some other videos um, and you can get it in bigger amounts as well. The assortment packs come in one ounce increments. So this is how it comes. It's really thick. You can separate it into really thin layers, but you can also pull off little tiny pieces. And that's really the magic for doing the portraits like this is you don't have long hairs that you're trying to work with when that's what you want. Sometimes you might want a longer fiber. So let's look at the colors that we're using. And of course we're going to make blends from these also. Sometimes you might find that you layer and sometimes you might make blends. Um, and we'll look at those as we go along. So starting right here, this is our cinnamon brown. This is pumpkin spice, dark chocolate, espresso brown, clay, and caramel. This is black onyx, charcoal gray, winter gray, aspen, cotton white. This is our CX2, it's not Merino Cross, it's CX2, bright white. It's the brightest white we sell. You'll notice it's a little more wiry. The texture's a little different, but it'll felt in or blend in with these just great. Um, this is a blend that I mixed up actually. I'll show you the, the pink later. We have an orchid pink and a soft pink and this is a blend that I made um, which is a little bit lighter and we're coming out with a lighter shade of pink this year. So really great for like these little areas here. And then I suggest just a little collection of blues. You might not realize it but sometimes the sheen on black fur um, strikes really well with blue or sometimes little places in the eye and we're going to get in real close in here in a minute and there's reflections of the sky in the eye that blue is perfect for and this is our indigo which I might blend with gray right here in the iris because this eye is not solid black and um, that's what we're going to do so this is the collection of colors we're starting with and we'll blend them up as we go along. If you want to pre-blend, see our carding video that we did to help support this and show you as well. And just as an example, let me move these colors out of the way. Let's see, these are the ones. I'll move everyone out. Sometimes I just make my own little blends and then I'll mark them. So, clay to get the colors that might support this dog a little bit better because notice that nothing is ever just one one color i mixed clay with this color's clay right here with our pumpkin spice here to get this just a little bit it's just a little bit less bright a little bit less orangey this is great for a fox uh, for a, maybe for an iris setter, but for this dog, you might want to go just a little more muted. And then this color here, pre-blending can sometimes just really help speed things up for you. And this is clay with our dark brown. So these two together. And I hand carded these using our hand cards. So when you do a bigger piece, you might want to 
card the fiber up or if you don't have hand cards to pre-mix it so that you're not constantly making new little batches. And I'll show you that as we go along because in some places that's exactly what we'll do, but you might want more consistency.